Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinn and I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mitch, oh excuse me, Mitch Ramuda. He's with the program in cellular and molecular biology, and he's in the uh, Dave O'Connor lab. Uh, Mitch, I'm about to ask you the five questions I ask everybody. You can answer the questions in any way that you would like. It doesn't have to be true, it just has to be believable. <laughs> Mitch, where were you born? Uh, I was born in a small town called Cedarburg, Wisconsin, just north of Milwaukee. And where'd you go to high school? Uh, Cedarburg High School. And then where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? So I went to undergrad at UW-Madison and I studied animal science and with an emphasis in poultry. And so, yeah. Were you here when Mark Cook was still here? Yes, uh, Mark was actually really pivotal in, in my undergrad time. And so he's the reason why I got involved with infectious disease research and really pursued grad school, so. He has left quite a legacy. Yes, that's for sure. And now you're here getting your PhD? Yes, that is correct. Good. Uh, tonight you get to call a talk with us about pulling viruses out of thin air. One of my favorite topics during a worldwide pandemic of a deadly aerosol virus. <laughs> Would you please join me in welcoming Mitch Ramuda to Wednesday Night Lab. Thanks for having me. Well, I'd like to say thanks for the introduction. It's uh, a bit strange standing up here and seeing everyone. I think this is my first time giving an in-person talk since starting uh, grad school because I started grad school right before the pandemic started. And to be honest, it's uh, very nice to see everyone's faces. Uh, I've gotten pretty used to just seeing blank Zoom screens as I have given talks over the past few years. And so uh, I'm excited to talk today about our recent work in collaboration with Shelby O'Connor's lab to develop and implement uh, air sample uh, strategies for detecting respiratory viruses in congregate settings across the community. So here's an outline of my talk. I'll start with kind of giving an overview of the importance of viral surveillance and some of the challenges that we've faced uh, throughout the pandemic. Then I'll talk about some background information on using air sampling as an alternative uh, surveillance strategy to detect uh, respiratory pathogens. And then I'll talk about our recent work that was published for using air sampling to detect SARS-CoV-2 in a variety of, of communities across Wisconsin and Minnesota. And then I'll talk about some of our ongoing projects and where we see the future of viral surveillance using environmental surveillance strategies uh, in the future. So let's dive in. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced the longstanding concern that the United States is underprepared to respond to both unexpected and seasonal respiratory pathogens. Almost three years into the pandemic, uh, we've experienced you know, over ni 98 million uh, SARS or COVID-19 cases and also over 1 million uh, deaths caused by the pandemic. And furthermore, we've seen this year uh, the most COVID-19 cases throughout the pandemic, and that was uh, following the emergence of Omicron variant concern uh, in the community. So unfortunately, this year we're experiencing what uh, future respiratory virus seasons might look like when we add COVID-19 into the mix. Uh, as you know, the majority of the population returns to you know, lifestyles of, of pre-pandemic pre times, and there's a decrease in risk mitigation strategies. 
So public health officials around the U.S. are seeing you know, a rapid and early rise in influenza-like illness um, across the country. And this rise in influenza-like illness has been uh, attributed to three different viruses, including uh, RSV, influenza A virus, and SARS-CoV-2. And the surge in RSV specifically has caused a rapid increase in the hospitalizations of, of children across the country and has overwhelmed uh, pediatric ICUs. And so there's really a, a pressing need to improve the surveillance methods that we use to detect respiratory pathogens, to uh, increase public health awareness of the prevalence within communities, and then help guide the public health response to better uh, respond to uh, these seasonal pathogens or also unexpected uh, pathogens in the future. So, Viral testing and genomic surveillance have played an integral role in the pandemic response. Um, surveillance efforts have mainly focused on individual testing of clinical samples to estimate disease burden and genomic sequencing to identify variants of concern and track them through space and time. Um, surveillance programs can help provide uh, public health authorities with uh, very valuable information um, and can help them make more accurate estimates of disease burden in a country, um, can possibly act as early warning signs of outbreaks that are occurring. It can help um, public health authorities evaluate the effectiveness of uh, public health policies and risk mitigation strategies that are implemented in different areas. And then it can also be used to help allocate resources to communities that, that are in need. So, however, the United States has, has really struggled to develop and maintain uh, testing systems that provide accurate uh, representations of disease burden and transmission risk uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, early on in the pandemic, uh, we saw problems with the first generation PCR tests and that really delayed uh, genomic testing throughout the country um, early on. And then furthermore, we saw testing supply shortages and uh, guidelines set by public health that really prioritized symptom-based screening for, uh, for individuals. And this really inhibited the uh, the testing for population surveillance during this time for, for much of the pandemic. Um, however, you know, we've, we've come a long way since the beginning of the pandemic, um, but we're facing new uh, issues at hand of, that affects the, the, uh, the surveillance programs that, that we currently have. And so individual testing programs are, you know, very expensive and difficult to maintain. And so we've seen a lot of states across the country really close down mass uh, testing sites across these areas. And we've also seen a drop in testing demand as there's been a shift in the public sentiment towards the pandemic. And uh, as people have you know, experienced more pandemic fa fatigue that has kind of affected their willingness to go out and go get tested when they're feeling symptoms. Um, and then furthermore, at home testing that has become widely available uh, does not require mandatory uh, case reporting to public health authorities. And so as a result, this could lead to uh, uh, less accurate case counts uh, as the pandemic continues. And so there's a need to uh, develop new testing strategies that, that can help uh, kind of go past these limitations of individual testing. So one of the major questions moving forward is, you know, how can we improve surveillance strategies to better prepare for future outbreaks? And this is an important question to ask because future pandemics are inevitable and it's not a question of if, but when they will occur. 
So next, I'll talk about air sampling as an alternative uh, environmental surveillance strategy for detecting viruses. Um, alternative environmental surveillance strategies that circumvent limitations of individual testing can provide more rapid and efficient assessment of disease uh, or transmission risk within a community. So air sampling is a form of environmental uh, surveillance that has recently gained attention for detecting SARS-CoV-2. And while the idea of pulling viruses out of thin air might seem far-fetched, it's not a new practice at all. For almost a century, uh, passive and active air sampling techniques have been used to detect a variety of microbes, including viruses, uh, bacteria, and fungi, uh, when infected individuals produce uh, aerosol particles and large respiratory droplets as they speak, uh, sneeze, cough, or talk. Uh, active air samplers pull in air from a large surrounding area. And this is really important because when aerosol particles are produced from an individual, they're you know, dispersed uh, rapidly in the environment. And so this really helps uh, capturing all the particles that, that are released by someone. Um, active air samplers have previously been used to detect other viruses uh, in congregate settings, such as influenza A virus. Um, and most notably, uh, the United States uh, Department of Homeland Security used active air samplers as routine monitoring systems to detect specific biological threats to combat bioterrorism uh, after 2003. So we pursued air sampling as an uh, approach that enables virus detection that bypasses these limitations of individual surveillance. And so air samples uh, contain a, a mixture of, of uh, respiratory particles that, that are released by individuals. And so this could allow us to pick up uh, exhaled components from many different individuals, including individuals who might be infected but are asymptomatic at the time. Um, furthermore, air, sam air samples have the ability to detect SARS-CoV-2 in the community regardless of test-seeking behavior um, because it's just uh, pulling in air from people around and, and not requiring someone to go out and, and get a test by themselves. And so unlike other uh, environmental surveillance strategies, air samples are really easy to move around. And so this could help provide uh, surveillance data with a high spatial resolution within a community, even down to a single room in a building. So in March uh, 2021, Thermo Fisher uh, released a low cost air sampler called the Aerosol Sense Machine. And so this machine has gained a lot of interest in the industry um, because it's very easy to use and it's very compact in its design. Um, the machine uses a syringe-like air sample to collect aerosol particles from a large uh, area. And so the machine draws air in from the top and draws these exhaled components over two sponge-like particles or uh, substrates that are within this syringe. Um, and so this, these filters are able to collect a, a wide range of, of aerosol particle sizes, which is really important because when someone uh, creates aerosols, we get a large range in the diameter of size and that affects how they disperse in the environment too. And so one of the key advantages of this is that there's minimal training required to be able to use this machine and the air samples are compatible with a lot of downstream pathogen detection assays. So next I'll talk about our work in developing an air sampling strategy using the aerosol sense machine uh, for detecting SARS-CoV-2 and other respiratory pathogens uh, in the community. So 
Over the past year, I had a really great opportunity to work on this large collaborative study with uh, universities and public health labs across uh, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And this work was recently published in Nature Communications. So our study aimed to assess the feasibility of using air sampling to detect SARS-CoV-2 in real world settings. Um, develop a workflow that task shift air sample handling and management to individuals with limited scientific training, and then expand surveillance efforts to detect other respiratory pathogens uh, within the community. So we developed an air sampling program with collaborators uh, at the University of Minnesota, Mayo Clinic, and the City of Milwaukee Health Department. Um, and we deployed air samplers uh, in from uh, July 21st through February 22nd in 15 different congregate settings across four communities in these two states, as seen on the figure to the right. And so we collected air samples from daily and weekly testing intervals to test for viruses. So to deploy these air samplers, uh, we worked with our testing sites to identify high traffic areas where there's a lot of individuals in the building. And so we wanted to pick high traffic areas to be able to collect a mixture of exhaled components from a lot of people and, and really get an efficient pooled sample of what is being detected in these areas. And so we also worked with them to find areas where the noise of the air sampler wouldn't cause too much of a disruption. Um, and the pictures on this slide just show some of the areas that we uh, de deployed some of these air samples in, which include you know, hallways at schools, cafeterias, and athletic training facilities where a lot of people will congregate for extended periods of time. So our testing sites also include areas such as bars and coffee shops where throughout the pandemic, people you know, will take masks off to be able to eat and drink. And this has allowed us to really capture a lot of particles in these settings. So over the course of the study, uh, we trained users at each of our testing sites on how to reliably operate the air samplers and then coordinate data collection between our lab and the testing site. Um, to streamline this process, we developed a user-friendly workflow for uh, collecting the air samples, uh, recording all of the metadata associated with an air sample, uh, testing the samples, and then reporting those test results right back to the, uh, the testing sites. And so this workflow really depends uh, on the Ask Kid mobile app, which is an app that was developed by Eli O'Connor, who's Dave and Shelby's son. Um, next, I'll demonstrate how we insert air sample cartridges and how easy it is to really collect the data from these samples. So in my hand, I have the syringe-like air sample. Um, here is the Thermo Fisher aerosol sense sampling machine. As you can see, it's very small in size, and, and, but it is quite heavy if, if you try to pick it up. So to insert the air cartridge, someone at these testing sites just pull out their phone. They open the Ask Kid mobile app and they enter the unique sampler name for that, that location. They take a picture of the unique barcode that comes on every air sample, and then they just mark uh, if it was going in or out. Then the user takes off the cap from the air sample and puts it on the inside of the door and simply screws in the air sample until it locks in place. Um, one of the big benefits of this syringe-like air sample is that the filters on the inside aren't exposed to the user at all, so we're not really worried about contamination from whoever's putting in the air sample. Then to collect it, the user just simply pushes it in, so that really exposes those filters on the inside, and they 
close the door and the sampler will start running. Then when they're done, you just open up the door, take the sample out, then cap the air sample and take another photo with the Askin mobile app. And when you take the photo with the app, it records information of the unique barcode for the air sample, where it was collected, and then a timestamp for when it was inserted or removed. And so we know the exact duration of how long this air sample was collected for. So once these air samples are collected, they're transported to our labs for viral testing using assays that are used to test uh, COVID-19 uh, clinical samples uh, in the field. And so with this, we use, um, so when the air sample arrives in our building, we take the sample and we take these filters out of the cartridge and we elute the aerosol particles in a liquid. And so that really just kind of pulls everything off of these sponge-like substances. Then we isolate the viral ge uh, genetic material from these samples. And then we run pathogen-specific PCR assays to uh, amplify the genetic material and then detect the viruses that are present in these samples. So during the 29-week period, we collected hundreds of air cartridges from 15 sites. And this included two preschools, uh, four K through 12 schools, two hospitals, a campus athletic training facility, uh, campus coffee shop, uh, office space, two uh, bars, and then also two emergency housing facilities. Uh, throughout the study, we detected uh, SARS-CoV-2 in almost every testing site. And so together, these, these data provide evidence that, that um, we can reliably detect SARS-CoV-2 in air samples from a wide range of uh, congregate settings. And so this really addressed a key knowledge gap of how these air samplers perform in the real world, because virtually all of the, the studies before this tested out the aerosol sense machines in controlled environments with, uh, in the presence of people with known infection statuses. Um, and so by testing these air samples uh, in these real world settings, it was impossible to know the COVID-19 status of every individual who came into contact with these air samplers. Um, but we were able to retrospectively correlate uh, positive air samples with reported cases in many of the testing sites over the, the course of the study. So next I'll talk about one study in per, or one site in particular where uh, air samplers detected SARS-CoV-2 during a COVID-19 outbreak that led to a total of uh, 20 uh, cases. And so during the course of this outbreak, five individuals uh, had COVID-19 cases that were detected while they were on site uh, at the testing site. And this is represented by the orange circles on the figure. Um, then individuals that gathered in the same rooms as these individuals when they were positive were quarantined at home uh, for seven days. And so this is represented by the blue boxes on the figure. And uh, at this testing site, close contacts, uh, there is 15 cases that happened while these individuals were at home. Um, and so when we look at sur air surveillance data overlapped with the case reports, we see that air samples were positive before the first uh, case was detected in this congregate setting, and then throughout throughout, there we go, um, <laughs> throughout the outbreak. Um, and so we also see that air samples collected after the last reported case in the, the building were either inconclusive or negative for SARS-CoV-2. And so this suggests that, that 
transmission risk could have possibly uh, been estimated with air sampling alone for this outbreak had individual testing data not been available for these individuals. So to explore whether uh, pathogens other than SARS-CoV-2 are detected in the same air sample, we uh, tested air samples for the presence of 40 other respiratory pathogens um, that included bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And so the full range of respiratory pathogens that we tested these air samples for are included in the table to the right. Um, we performed this testing on air samples from eight surveillance testing sites across Dane County. Um, and this, again, included the campus coffee shop, the campus athletic training facility, uh, preschools, an office space, and uh, four K through 12 schools. So throughout the 15 weeks that we tested air samples for these 40 different uh, respiratory pathogens, we detected commensal or, or transiently commensal uh, bacteria in these samples. And so these are just microbes that can live harmlessly within our airways, but can also um, cause illness in some individuals. And these microbes have been frequently detected in, in other studies. We also detected respiratory pathogens that are associated with seasonal illness. Uh, in school age children, including human coronaviruses, uh, uh, RSV, parainfluenza virus, uh, adenovirus, and SARS-CoV-2. And so next, I'll just focus on the detection of SARS-CoV-2 and flu in the community um, specifically. So over the course of the 15 weeks, we saw uh, distinct differences in where we detected these viruses in the community. Um, with SARS-CoV-2, we intermittently detected it across almost every single testing site over these 15 weeks. And we saw an increase in detection following the holidays and also the emergence of Omicron in the community. Um, however, when we look at influenza virus, we see a striking difference in our detection of, of this virus in the community. We see that influenza virus was mainly detected on college campus sites throughout the two months. And this really uh, coincided with reports of, of influenza uh, a virus outbreaks on college campuses that weren't really observed in the larger surrounding community. Uh, and so this was, was very interesting for us to see and especially looking at the detection of, of flu within the schools during this time, we only detected it in a few of the schools and detected it later in the year, uh, kind of towards May and April. So when we expand this figure to include other viruses that cause acute disease, uh, we observe distinct uh, types of, of, of pathogen signatures in different congregate settings. And so looking back at the campus coffee shop that I talked about in last slide, uh, we see the frequent detection of flu and SARS-CoV-2 in this setting. But I'd also like to point out this kind of gap in virus detection uh, between the end of December and mid-January. And so this coincided with the end of the fall semester and the start of the holiday break. And so this coffee shop was closed to students during this time. And we kind of saw a drop in what we were detecting, which was really good for us to see. However, when we look at the viruses then that are detected in a preschool during this time, we see low amounts of SARS-CoV-2 detection in these air samples, but we see a wider variety in the viruses that, that we detect. And so this is really consistent with previous studies that, that have um, observed higher frequencies in respiratory illnesses in uh, school-aged children in, in preschools and daycares. Um, I don't have a child myself, but working with, with many uh, scientists who have little uh, 
kids at home, they're always talking about, you know, what pathogens they're bringing home and, and always having uh, the snuffles and, and runny noses and, and such. So this was really interesting to see. So with every surveillance strategy, there's, you know, limitations with its use. And so by testing air samples with PCR, uh, we can't really distinguish if we're detecting in intact infectious virus or just genetic material from these viruses that pose no risk to, to us as we breathe them in. Um, and also, because we don't know the, you know, everyone who is coming in contact with these air samplers and we don't know their COVID-19 status, it's impossible for us to really pin down the, the, uh, the source of the pathogens that we're detecting in these air samplers also. And lastly, I'd like to point out that a negative air sample doesn't mean that you know, an infected individual isn't in the building. And so this is because being able to detect a virus on an air sampler depends on many different factors, including you know, how big of a room we're in, uh, how long the air sampler is running and how much air it samples, um, how close an infected individual is to the air sampler. Um, and so this is something that we've been really trying to optimize as we continue air sampling in, in the community. And so, however, even with these limitations, we think that air surveillance could play a really important role in complementing other surveillance strategies in the future. So some of the major takeaways from the study was that we can reliably detect SARS-CoV-2 frequently in, in a wide range of real world settings using the aerosol sense sampler. Um, we also have shown that staff with limited scientific training can easily handle the air samples and operate the machines and, and collect valuable data for each of the air samples. And then we can also uh, detect multiple pathogens in one air sample. Um, so next, I'll kind of start talking about some of our ongoing uh, projects to expand and improve air sampling in the community. So we're currently conducting two different stu uh, studies that are going on. One is uh, setting up an air surveillance network at a local school district in the area. And then the other is air sampling within a long-term care facility. So I'll start by talking about our study in K through 12 schools. So for this study, we deployed air samples at seven K through 12 schools in a new, uh, nearby school district. Uh, we began collecting air samples starting at the beginning of August, and we're hoping to continue to air sample throughout the whole uh, school year. So each week we collect two air samples from each school, and then those air samples are collected and transported back to our lab for uh, testing for uh, using PCR tests for SARS-CoV-2 and influenza A virus. And we're also planning to sequence some of these samples to be able to further uh, characterize the viruses that are captured in these air samples. Um, because schools are generally representative of the communities that they're located in, uh, we think this project could also allow us to assess whether COVID-19 uh, surveillance in K through 12 schools with uh, air samplers can predict uh, COVID-19 burden within the larger surrounding community as well. So when we look at the detection of SARS-CoV-2 and influenza A virus in these, uh, in these schools, we see pretty similar trends to what we saw last year. We see that we're able to frequently detect SARS-CoV-2 in every single school throughout uh, this fall semester. Um, and this makes sense because SARS-CoV-19 has 
has been consistently present in the community and hasn't really been seasonal like we see with other viruses that start to uptick in the winter. Um, um, however, when we look at flu, we see a large absence in its detection for the majority of this fall. Um, until November, when we start seeing an increase in our detection across several of the schools. And so this has really uh, corresponded to increases in uh, flu cases that are being reported by the schools, um, by our collaborators that are um, actively going through individual surveillance when a uh, staff member or a student are symptomatic and, and go home feeling sick. So I'd also like to point out that compared to last year, we are seeing more flu in the schools. You know, if, if we remember back to the previous slide, we see that flu is really concentrated in the uh, campus testing sites and kind of very sparsely detected within the community. Uh, whereas now we're starting to see it in the schools and, and this really has coincided with uh, increased flu activity that uh, public health officials are seeing across the country and also in our community right now. And so I'd also like to point out that the high prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 detection in these schools really makes it hard to uh, use air sampling data to implement changes in risk mitigation strategies. Um, and this also kind of coincides with the shift in public sentiment that we know is there. Um, but I think you know, a lot of people are ready to move on. Um, however, we really think that air sampling is a great tool that could be used for identifying different SARS-CoV-2 variants um, over time within the community uh, through genomic sequencing. And so this would be really important addition to our toolkit, especially as uh, individual testing decreases. So we know that we can detect viral genetic material in these air samples by PCR, but one of the main questions is, you know, can we sequence it to further characterize these viruses? And so sequencing the genomes of viruses allows us to really distinguish them and further characterize them and, and learn more about their biology. And so COVID-19 variants can only be uh, identified using sequencing. And you can kind of think about this as like 23andMe for viruses. So to demonstrate the feasibility of genotyping SARS-CoV-2 from air samples that were collected from uh, different uh, testing sites, we used a targeted approach that has been used for wastewater uh, sequencing. And we chose this approach because we thought it would uh, increase our chances of being able to identify COVID-19 within these air samples that contain very low amounts of genetic material um, compared to a nasal swab that can contain you know, a lot of, of virus in them. So sequencing primers targeted the spike receptor uh, binding domain of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so this region is really important for virus attachment to host cells and entry during infection. And it also can, is an area of the genome that contains uh, important mutations uh, that we can use to identify the different variants. And so in our previous study, uh, we sequenced, uh, we successfully sequenced nine different air samples from a brewery within uh, Minnesota between November and the end of January. And so uh, these sequencing results are, are shown in this figure to the right. Uh, the gray boxes, sorry, I'm trying to get my mouse up here. The gray boxes on the, the x-axis represent air samples that were collected during this time, during the, the weekly intervals. And then the uh, chart plotted above shows the lineage distribution of SARS-CoV-2 variants within clinical samples that was detected by the Minnesota Public Health uh, in the community during this time. 
And so when we look at the, the data, we see that between November and December, we were able to identify um, delta sequences within the air samples during this time. And this was the main uh, COVID-19 variant that was predominated in this region. Um, and that can be observed by the, the red boxes above. And then when we look at the samples that were collected at the end of December uh, through January, we see this transition in what variants we detect in the air samples. And so from these uh, six air samples, we, or five air samples, sorry, we detect uh, the Omicron variant of concern uh, in these air samples. And this coincided with the emergence of Omicron in the community. Um, I'd also like to point out that uh, what, for one of the samples that was collected at the end of December and early January, we were able to see a mixture of Delta and Omicron sequences in these air samples. And so that was really promising to see um, because these data support that, that the genetic material that's captured in air samples really paralleled what variants were being observed in the community at that time. And so as kind of bringing this back to our, our new study at K through 12 schools, we're really excited to implement this sequencing approach on air samples that are SARS-CoV-2 positive to continue to look at what variants are, are present at the schools um, in the nearby community. So, Next, I'll talk about our other ongoing study where we're air, uh, implementing air sampling at a uh, long-term care facility. So SARS-CoV-2 has disproportionately affected residents of, of long-term care facilities. And so long-term care facilities are also um, high risk for outbreaks of other respiratory pathogens, such as flu and RSV. And this is because of many underlying reasons, including the medical status of residents, um, the fact that many residents live in multi-bed rooms, and then also residents have uh, a lot of interactions with staff or visitors that, that could be infected with these different respiratory pathogens. And so similar to our, our air sampling approach in K through 12 schools, We've deployed uh, two air samplers in high traffic areas of this long-term care facility, including the uh, common area where residents and staff members congregate often, and also the physical therapy room where residents often go through exercises and might be an area where they produce a, a lot of aerosols from this increase in, in activity. Uh, this project aims to determine the prevalence of, of SARS-CoV-2 and influenza A virus in the air, and then also assess the correlation with, um, with the case counts in this, in this facility to better uh, make decision-making uh, framework for implementing risk mitigation strategies using air samples. So, the figure on the right shows the PCR results for uh, two air samplers de deployed in the uh, long-term care facility. Uh, and this, as I mentioned, this includes the common area and physical therapy room. And so I should point out that staff are tested for COVID-19 on a weekly basis, whereas the residents within the facility are only tested when they're symptomatic for uh, respiratory illness. And so these data show that air samples are able to detect SARS-CoV-2 when a case is reported in the, in the facility, but we don't always detect a positive air sample when a case is reported. And this makes sense because, as I mentioned before, the ability to detect a virus in an air sample depends on many different factors. And so let's say a resident or a staff member is, is positive uh, for COVID-19, but they never are in proximity to this air sampler, then we don't expect to, to pick it up. Um, 
However, one thing that, that has puzzled us and, and we've began to really investigate why we're seeing this is that at the physical therapy room, we saw kind of this prolonged detection of, of SARS-CoV-2 in an air sample, but we didn't see any reported cases from staff or residents during this time. And so we have several different hypotheses for this, um, and I'd be happy to talk with them later on too. Um, so I should also point out that this is the figure for uh, COVID-19, but we haven't detected any flu in this facility, and also there's been no cases of flu in, in any of the staff or residents. So I'll be really interested in to continue to investigate you know, um, this correlation between air sampling data and, and case reports within a facility. So next, I'll talk about some of the future directions of where we see air sample testing going in the future. So one of the major questions that, that we had after our first study was if we can use unbiased sequencing as an approach to uh, detect unexpected pathogens that are captured in these air samples. And so I've been recently working on developing a strategy to perform uh, unbiased metagenomic sequencing on air samples to really expand the utility of, of air surveillance. Um, and this would help us not rely on pathogen-specific assays that we're currently using to test these samples. So as I mentioned before, we were using PCR testing for uh, looking at what viruses are present in these samples. And PCR requires you know, a perfect match of the virus genetic material and your assay to be able to detect the virus that is present in it. Whereas unbiased sequencing uses random primers to bind and amplify all of the genetic material that is captured in an air sample. And so this could allow us to detect other bacteria, viruses, and, and fungi that, that uh, are being collected in the air that, that we just aren't looking for at the moment. And so I recently tried metagenomic sequencing a handful of samples that were collected from last winter and spring from a variety of congregate settings. Um, with this method, I was able to detect viruses in nearly every sample that, that we collected. And this really provided uh, evidence that, that unbiased sequencing can be used to detect a wide range of pathogens, um, especially viruses in these air samples. And so I was able to detect uh, a total of 11 different human viruses in these samples, uh, including common respiratory viruses such as human rhinovirus, which is a very common cold virus. Um, SARS-CoV-2, as we've seen, has been very prevalent in the community during, throughout the pandemic. Um, and other viruses such as RSV-A. Uh, and so the this table just shows some of the sequencing results for six of these air samples. So I'd like to point out again um, the results for a K through or for a preschool, um, similar to the PCR results that we saw in our first study. We see that uh, a greater uh, diversity of viruses that we detect in these air samples at a preschool compared to other testing sites. And one thing that really surprised me was the detection of viruses that cause uh, gastrointestinal illness. And so that includes uh, rotaviruses and astroviruses. So I'd also like to point out uh, one of the cool uh, facts. And so at the brewery tap room, we we're able to detect a virus that infects the, the brewer's yeast. And so this really kind of shows that you know, different settings were able to detect these different pathogen signatures. So we don't often think of you know, the microbes that are present in the air we breathe just because we can't you know, see them. Uh, however, these studies have shown that we can detect the presence of many different viruses, bacteria um, in enclosed spaces. 
And so improvements in uh, unbiased metagenomic sequencing could help us further characterize what microbes are, are detected in these areas that, that we're breathing in. And so virus genetic material um, is just a small fraction of the sequences that, that we get from these samples. And so this can be seen on the figure to the right. Uh, virus, virus reads just make up 2% of what we're detecting in these samples, whereas another 65% are different bacteria and another 26% uh, are different uh, types of eukaryotes. And so overall, these data suggest that we can detect a wide variety of microbes in the air samples um, co collected from many different congregate settings. And so I'm really excited to continue to uh, try to optimize and, and improve this sequencing method uh, going forward so that we can really implement it in our current studies. So lastly, I'd like to see, you know, talk about some of the, the areas where we see uh, a long-term vision for air sample testing. And so one of the questions that I want to ask is, you know, can air surveillance be deployed in agricultural settings to be able to detect the presence of zoonotic pathogens uh, during outbreaks? And so many of uh, are you, many of you are aware of the, the rising costs of turkey prices, especially following Thanksgiving. And that's really because the U.S. is experiencing an uh, epidemic of high path avian influenza right now that has killed about 50 million uh, poultry in the U.S. And so being able to use air samplers to uh, to survey barns uh, early on to try to, to prevent these outbreaks could, could be of benefit. Um, also wondering if, you know, could we use air sampling in K through 12 schools and also pair that with other environmental surveillance strategies such as wastewater sequencing um, to provide data, population-wide data for communities um, as individual testing data decreases for uh, SARS-CoV-2. And this could be really important for looking at what variants are, are uh, detected throughout the community over time and, and help um, make changes to public health policy. And then our last kind of thought of what we can do with air sampling is, you know, can we deploy air samplers on international airplanes or uh, ports of entry uh, to detect emerging pathogens uh, around the world in the future? And so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a future pandemic is inevitable. And being able to use unbiased sequencing to look at uh, unexpected pathogens could be really useful for detecting uh, viruses as they emerge uh, in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed to this work. This has been you know, a very highly collaborative effort between multiple research groups and, and public health agencies. And it's really been a great pleasure uh, working with everyone on these studies. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you and open up the floor for any questions. Yes. Oh. Are there questions? OK. This is really cool. And I have a million questions. And I just want to plant another idea to your list of future directions is um, thinking about perhaps exploring the development of new variants of concern that could arise in bat caves. Because we know that uh, the closest reservoir species are bats. And even there with, with nasal swabs and anal swabs, um, scientists have detected 96% of similarity to SARS-CoV-2. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of what I'm thinking in terms of surveillance, is exploring what potential variants could emerge from reservoir species, potentially bats or rodents or you know wherever we think they would reside. Um, second thought I had is your instrumentation 
at first glance looks very portable, but you say it's heavy. And so it's like, how easy would it be to carry a thing like this? I don't know if Thermo Fisher, Fisher is actually developing um, future designs of this instrumentation where it's more portable. So a person with little training could carry this into a cave or uh, animal market, let's say, mm -hmm. and then they just randomly sample the air around that. You know, I don't know how easy that is. Third question is um, your filter cartridge. Yes. So I'm intrigued by the media that's being used, uh, I, and I'm pretty sure that's proprietary yeah. uh, information that Thermo Fisher has, and I'm fascinated by what the extraction process is and what your limit of detection would be. Because in all these studies that I've seen in analyzing de um, the presence of virus, no one, as far as I know, has, detect has offered quantitative analysis for limit of detection. And so it kind of leads me to think about, you can detect the virus, but we don't know at this point whether that level is infectious level versus a less infectious level or no infectious level. So it kind of, it could be used as a way to alarm people in a sense, if you show up and say, oh yeah, we detected uh, SARS-CoV-2 in your, in your school, and then what do we do? So, so is that we're not, uh, you know, I'm more concerned, like, is this something that I should worry about to send my kid to school if there's virus there, or, or do I not worry about it? So, but I think your research is very fascinating, so I, I hope to see more data later on. Thank you so much. All right, three for three. Here we yes. go. So <laughs> thank you for those questions. I think they're all very interesting questions, and, and I'd be happy to talk more about this in the future, too, about your other questions. So for your first question, you brought up different applications for using air surveillance in, in different areas. And you brought up uh, using air sampling in bat caves and also possibly live markets. And I think that's a great idea. And um, actually, as my professor has been uh, he's been traveling around visiting other universities and, and giving talks. We've also found out about other, uh, other labs that are doing exactly that. And so the aerosol sense sampler is a great machine, uh, but as you pointed out, it's, it's not very mobile and, and quite heavy. But the, the good thing is that because air sampling isn't you know, that new of a, a technology, there's a lot of other air samplers out there. And so one lab is actually using a, a smaller portable air sampler that has, is battery operated, and they're attaching it to drones and flying it into bat caves to look at what viruses they can detect in, in the bat caves too. And I've also noticed that um, come across a few papers that have air sampled in live markets where you're getting you know, combinations of many different animal species, which is an area where uh, disease outbreaks can really uh, be, propagate and, 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 and go on. And so with those studies, um, they've actually seen you know, transmission of high path avian influenza viruses to pigs and, and, and so on. So I think those are two great areas um, your second question, I'm, I remember the third question. I'm going to go to the third question. I'm going to try to remember the second. So the third question, you brought up the substrate that uh, is on these. Or no, no, this was the second question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you brought up the substrate uh, sponges that are in these air samples. Um, although it is proprietary information, we, we have tried to figure it out, but um, haven't had much luck. But other labs that are, um, air are creating these air surveillance networks, they're actually replacing these sponges with things like nasal swabs or um, other substrates to capture the virus. And they've had really good luck with if trying these other, um, other substrates out. And that also has been able to allow them to reduce the cost of their overall air sampling program and expand where they're sampling. And then your third question was, 
uh, quantitative detection of, of the virus genetic material that, that we're um, capturing in these air samples. And that's something that we're currently doing. On, in this uh, talk, I only kind of gave yes, no, is it present or is it not? But we have been running, uh, in our PCRSA, PCR assay, we've been running uh, standards to be able to quantify the uh, number of copies for the N1 gene that we use for the CDC assay and try to figure out how much we're detecting in these assays. But I agree. Uh, as you can see, we detect SARS-CoV-2 in a lot of these samples at schools. And I don't think the right response is, hey, everybody get out of the room. Um, I think messaging is very key to these, uh, these air sampling projects. And kind of like seeing flu pop up in the community, you know, if it's going to rain, I want to know so I can bring my umbrella. And so with this, if we, detect, if we start detecting flu in the community or in a school, sharing that data with the public, not to scare them, but to say, hey, yeah, we're starting to detect this. Hey, I haven't received my flu vaccine for the year. Maybe I should go and go and grab one because uh, for my kids because it's in the schools. Or it allows someone to make the decision, hey, I want to uh, start wearing a mask again because uh, we're seeing this uptick. Um, and it also allows schools to take uh, other risk mitigation strategies such as increasing ventilation in the winter or, or things like that to kind of uh, deplete the, the virus aerosols that are, are present in the environment. So, Other questions? Dan? Yes, so you say you have been trying to quantify and is this just uh, how many PCR cycles it takes before you get up to a detectable level, or how? Do, how so do that? we have that information, but we also uh, run different concentrations of the N1 gene, and so then we can extrapolate. We have um, you know a hundred copies of the SARS-CoV-2 N gene in in these samples, um, but it's also. Hard then we can then use that information then to extrapolate how many genome copies we're detecting uh, per uh, per liter of air that we're detecting because we have those those timestamps of how long an air right. air sample is being so collected. So you're able to quantify that how many copies there actually were in the original sample. Yes, correct. That information, those plots you were showing, what would they look like? Yeah, so we would see, again, so with some of the samples, we are detecting uh, levels that we think are sequenceable. But in terms of what that looks like for every sample, I think we're detecting very low amounts of, of uh, genetic material. So in terms of CT values, I'd say our average CT value is around 35 or 30, or between 33 and 35 for a lot of these air samples. Um, what is that number again? What do you call it? Uh, CT value is our cycle threshold value. That's PCR cycles? Yes, yeah. Good. What does that mean like, in terms of uh, complete the genome? Yeah, so in terms of a complete genome, I think it's it's very hard to sequence from samples with those higher uh, PCR cycle levels um, to be able to so when we are trying to sequence uh, samples in the beginning we were selecting some of our samples with the highest viral loads or the lower PCR CT cycles around 30 and so with that, we're using approaches to look at whole genome sequencing. And with that, you get you know, sparse detection across the genome. But when we use that targeted sequencing approach uh, that's been used by collaborators for, for wastewater sequencing, it really focuses on one area of the genome and really allowed us to increase 
what samples were sequenceable for us. And so that pushed our CT level up about 35, um, give or take there. And so that allowed us to be able to identify variants in those samples with lower genetic material. But what you'd really like to have is an estimate of how many infectious particles are there to be put in the air, and how close are you to being able to do something like that? Yeah, so that is something, so we haven't tried to measure infectious virus or, or culture virus from these samples, and that is because of a few different reasons. Um, our lab space, our, our biosafety protocol for our lab doesn't allow us to try to culture SARS-CoV-2, so we, we just can't do it. Other labs have tried it uh, that are pursuing air surveillance and, and have been able to draw it from uh, hospital rooms or Uber drives or, or things like that. Um, however, I think the nature of our study, we're using uh, a impactor uh, air sampler that has a, a dry filter substrate and we're collecting air for a long period of time. And so I think drawing that air over a sponge for you know three days to a week really uh, disrupts the, the viability of a virus. So I, I don't think we'd have much success of, of being able to do it. I think we'd have to shorten that interval and use other air samples that, that collect in uh, liquid media. You haven't been able to tell from just the distribution of fragments that you see what the likelihood it is that there being impact particles there. Yeah, I think, I think it's just really hard to be able to make that comparison of, uh, of virus level and, and infectious virus in, in the air sample right now. And it's something that, that a lot of people are, are working on. And then Dareth at home asks, uh, it seems to me that to be functionally useful in ports of entry or on airplanes, the samples would need to be tested closer to real time. Is that capability in the works? Yeah, so that's something that we've been working on. We've uh, been working to deploy point of care testing for air, air samples. Um, right now, PCR tests, we get a turnaround of time of you know, 24 hours to 48 hours. But in the long-term care facility, we are trying to use a uh, point of care test that allowed us to detect virus within 30 minutes of having that sample. And we were able to successfully detect virus in those samples, but it was quite an expensive assay and, and we, were, uh, we kind of stopped doing that. But I think that's an area that we have a lot of interest, not only for P uh, PCR testing in real time or whether it's an antigen test you use on an air sample, but using sequencing methods that are also real-time, like Oxford nanopore sequencing, um, as we try to improve these methodologies. Is there any thought for separating presence of viral genetic material, or fragments, from the presence of infectious, complete viral particles? I think you've addressed that, but if you want to just restate. Yeah, I think, Again, we, we can't do that in our lab right now, but other labs have been, have been trying to do that. And I think having more of that information would, would be good for messaging of what a positive air sample means. And so I think uh, it's, a, it's a question and that a lot of people are pursuing right now. And one last one. Has anyone developed an air sampling machine that runs genomic testing in real time? You know, I, I don't think I am aware of, of any sampler that can currently do that right now. And so that would be Sounds very good. interesting. I'd like to ask, what's the, how does your stuff compare to sewage sampling? To sewage sampling? Yeah. So, oh, let me see if I have a, you know, I took the figure out. So when you say how does it compare, do you mean what we see in the community or like uh, the testing method. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> sure, make me sound more intelligent than I am. Sorry. Well, which is easily done, by the so way. So I'll say that I think both of them are great uh, for collecting uh, efficient pool sample from a large amount of individuals. However, uh, wastewater testing, uh, 
So testing at a wastewater treatment site, uh, such as the one in Madison, you know, provides a sample for uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, which could mask transmission risk because transmission varies widely across different congregate settings. And so having an air sampler, you're, you're still able to pool, uh, have kind of like a pooled sample for many individuals, but you're able to put them in, a, uh, in multiple areas across the community. So I think it would really be ideal to use them together kind of play off their strengths and weaknesses. Sounds good. Other questions? Here we go. That's all right. I apologize. I'm monopolizing all this time. But um, if your study brings to mind of another um, description I heard in a recent publication of a set of tr dogs that, that were trained to be able to detect uh, the virus from certain individuals. And I think the idea that came to mind as I was listening to this was that perhaps if it was difficult to detect actual virus, is it possible to detect other volatiles that are associated with infectious disease? So I'm, I'm wondering if that could be employed in your assay in terms of if it's too difficult to look for virus particles itself, is there, is there a possibility of looking for other um, metabolites or other species that are associated with infection? So just an idea. Yeah. So I do think that's a very interesting point. And I'll bring this back to the beginning of the talk, uh, bringing up Mark Cook, and uh, who used to be a, a professor on campus. And so they actually were developing a um, strategy for collecting uh, breath from individuals and then looking at metabolites that might suggest that there's an infection uh, to be able to uh, look for that. And so while I don't think that using that technology has uh, been used widely for something like an aerosol sense sampler in a room, it has been used uh, or explored its use for individual people. Um, so yeah, very interesting. A couple Library. Um, next week, Dan McCammon will be giving our talk, and he's here tonight, and he'll be talking about what the heck is X-ray astronomy, and why do we bother? Did I get that correctly? Yes, I did. Yay. And next Thursday, December 15th at 9 p.m. on PBS uh, University Place, all of PBS Wisconsin, Will Vikes talk. A room over at Memorial Union so that we 